Hello, everyone. Again, I am excited to be back with another conversation on preaching. And I am more than excited to introduce to you all a great friend of mine and also a professor that I learned a lot of great sermons from. This is my brother, Tim. Um, how you doing, Pastor? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. It's it's a, it's an honor and a joy to be here. And and for you to, you to introduce yourself so everybody can get acquainted with you, uh, let everybody know who you are, where you're from. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm originally from uh, South Korea, and um, I'm currently here in Berrien Springs. And um, but I do pastor a church in um the um uh, in the Chicago area. I'm a pastor of uh, Lombard Fellowships of the Adventist Church in Lombard, Illinois. Um, I'm also taking class. Um, I'm a PhD student here at the seminary, um, specializing in the New Testament. And um, like uh, Chris, Chris said, um, I've been teaching Greek in the seminary for a few sem semesters now. Amen. Uh, married to my uh, um, wife for 11 years and six days, uh, married to Janelle, uh, my best friend. And I have two kids between us, uh, a girl who's turning nine and a boy who's turning six. And it's been it's been awesome. It's been Praise awesome. God. Praise God. And, you know, um, one of my experiences that I'll give, I'll give a personal testimony from taking Greek was it was very inspiring for me as a student to be able to learn the biblical language and also learn how to preach it. So that's one thing I liked about the class. You There's every single class, there's always great things and challenges because we're going through our masters. But Absolutely. on a positive learning note, I really appreciate how there's times when we could ask questions about a specific text and say, um, professor, how do we preach it? And then we would get feedback on how to preach it from the, not only from the Greek context, the language side, but also from the practical side, like how to apply it to mm -hmm. our everyday life. So I was really appreciative of that. And I wrote down, I know you saw me writing down my sermons. So I may have mm -hmm. maybe preaching a few sermons that I got from your class. So <laughs> praise, God for that. praise God for that. Yeah. Thanks for the kind feedback. You know, it was a really, really good class. Um, you know, the, the students were amazing and it's, a, it was a seven 30 uh, morning class for, um, for those out there on uh, seven 30 morning in the morning is probably not the best time to study, you know, take a class, but it was an awesome class. Lots of laughing and lots of, lots of fun in that class. And uh, like you said, you know, I don't want, the 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 text to i don't want the greek text and the, the the scripture to be you know a dry passage that that we're just studying academically you know the word of god is living and active and you know i wanted to do the work that it should be doing in our lives and you know and uh, i really wanted my students to, to take the word you know you know wrestle with the greek so that it becomes more alive for them so that they can take it to their members that they can take it to their parishioners and preach the word with power and and to to, to just love the word because I just love this word so much. And um, I just wanted to kind of convey that. And, and I know that the students do too, but, you know, getting a deeper appreciation for the word uh, through the original languages and so on and so forth. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And as we uh, dive in, I'm going to, we're going to say a short word of prayer. And before we begin, sure. And let's ask God to be with us. Father in heaven, as we start to speak about preaching your word we ask for your spirit to guide us lord and mm -hmm. as we come to the throne of grace we humble ourselves lord because we realize it's all about you it's all about you and within ourselves we have nothing to bring we have our experiences we have our knowledge but you have the wisdom and you have the power and we ask you for that as we have this conversation that you will come inside of us and bring thoughts to our mind bring texts scriptures to our mind and also continue to abide with us so that when we speak and when we present your word we do it with humility because we realize it's all about you jesus so thank you for this opportunity in jesus name we pray amen 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 so one of the first questions i want as we start the topic of preaching is why is preaching important to you because for me when i start to learn about preaching from people Instead of we can go into the theory, but I also like the personal testimony of like, why do you love preaching? So um, what I really believe is that um, the gospel is the power of God. It, you know, Paul doesn't say that, you know, the gospel has the power of God or the gospel conveys the power of God. 
Paul actually says that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. And, you know, when I'm standing on the pulpit, you know, it's not a time where I'm just, you know, talking about theories or, you know, it's not a time where I'm just talking about myself or my stories or, or things that I've read in the papers. You know, it's a time where people can actually experience the power of God through the word of God. So, you know, actually, you know, I, I really do love the um, the act of preaching. It's just it's just a, such a joy of mine. And um, I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to do it on a weekly basis. And I, I really, you know, I mean, what, you know, sometimes, you know, there are weeks that I'm not able to preach for and I, and I love listening to others preaching. But, you know, it's just I really just love to preach on a weekly basis and um, the bringing people to the word of God, diving into the word of God together and digging together through the word of God and finding gems in there that will actually transform the lives of people, that, that, that people will see Jesus through these texts is such an awesome experience for me. So, you know, you know, even if I'm retired, you know, if, if God will bless me to, to be able to continue to preach, you know, till the day I die, you know, I would be a blessed man. Yeah, I feel the same way. You know, that's the same thought that comes to my mind. If I could preach until the day I die by the grace of God, I would be blessed, you know, that's, that's a blessing. You know, one of the things you brought up, which was um, really powerful is, and I noticed it in your preaching because I went to your YouTube page and I, um, I'm blessed and, and it comes, it's not about you. It, it comes down to the fact of the need in my personal life. When Sabbath comes around, it's something about me that I just want to open the Bible and see something that will transform me and have me closer to Jesus, you know? So when I go to your sermons, there's a part of it where I'm like, all right, if you, when I've, I've seen a pattern in your preaching where you open up the text, you talk about the text, you talk about the background, but you also bring it back where it's like, this is what God is trying to do through you. Like, for example, you was preaching on um Jesus at the wedding and you were talking about like that transformation that God is trying to do, that washing, that, that, uh, and you were even talking about, you were doing a sermon series on John and you were talking about the new life that he was telling Nicodemus, you know? So all those things. And I, I was really blessed by it. And that's one of the things where you talk about the power of God and preaching. When we go to a place, it's like, it's a blessing for a listener to know that the pastor studied and they found a gem that if I listen to this and I apply it to the text and I find it from the text, it's going to transform my life. And then you leave church and your head is high and you're like, wow, I just got a blessing, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, you know, there are different styles of preaching and I understand that, but, you know, I think we kind of lack today, um, an emphasis on the word of God itself. You know, sometimes, you know, you have stories and, you know, what people very often they remember the stories, but not so much, you know, what was preached from the Bible itself. And, you know, if I if I could, you know, throw out a challenge to all the preachers out there, you know, we really need to be preaching the word of God. And yes, we can add examples to it. You know, we can talk about stories that that relate to the passage so, so that we can help people understand. But we need to help them understand the word of God and meet Jesus in the word of God, himself, God, God itself. And, you know, the way that John introduces Jesus is Jesus is the word. And and if we're not meeting, you know, coming to the word, but rather just talking about, you know, awesome, fluffy ideas, you know, nice, nice, cozy feeling stuff. And I mean, those things, you know, can be helpful, but but we really need to be bringing people to the word of God to help them meet Jesus in the word of God. And that's, I think, really our primary t task. You know, we're not there to to just just talk about you know, different ideas we had throughout the week. We really need to preach the word. Amen. Yeah, I just made a note. I wrote down, how do how does the listener meet Jesus in this text? Hmm. So that's one of the questions we should ask, especially when we are going to preach. How does the listener meet Jesus in the text? You know, now hmm. I want to I want to um transition. I was I was doing that just so we could get an introduction and to meet sure. Jesus. But sure. I'm excited because I know that you love Romans. Absolutely. 
And before we dive into this conversation about Romans, how did this happen for you? How did you fall in love with this letter of Romans? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, you know, as as Christians, you know, we read through the Bible. You know, we we read through um, Romans and so on and so forth. And it didn't do much for me, to be honest with you, for for many years. But um, after I started pastoring, um, when when I do when when I preach, I'm I'm always preaching in series, almost always exclusively, and I usually preach through Bible books. So I go through the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark, you know, um, Genesis, and so on and so forth. And I finally got to the book of Romans, probably year four in my my ministry. And um, man, the book of Romans broke me, to be honest with you. Um, you know, my my wife will tell you, you know, to be honest with you, the the four or five months that I was preaching through Romans was depressing in a way because it was revealing to me how sinful I was as, as you know, deeper I get into the passage, you know, I meet Jesus in this passage of Romans, you know, it, it challenges me and it it shows me how sinful I am and so on and so forth. And, and, um, but, you know, I think you have to go there. You have to go to how sinful you are to see the beauty of the gospel. The, the more sinful you recognize yourself to be, the more beautiful the gospel becomes because it saves you from the depths of the, your sinfulness and it takes you to, uh, to greater heights. So, Yes, it was somewhat depressing in a in a way that because I, I recognize my own sinfulness, but it, it took me to greater heights because of you know rec recognizing how sinful I am and so on and so forth. So it really was a transformational experience for me. Um, and um, so right now, um, I don't know if I said this earlier, but you know, right, my my dissertation is actually on the Book of Romans. So uh, my specialty will will more like uh, is going to be on the Book of Romans. So. I've been studying this book um, day in, day out, and uh, just been loving it. It's, it there, there's just so much here. And um, one thing about the, the, Paul is that Paul is, you know, he's the one that that brings the different um, doctrines together. He's the one that kind of compiles everything and, you know, he he, he he sets it down for you. And and I'm not trying to diss any other, you know, other um, biblical writers, but, you know, Paul is the one that that, that brings everything together and in such a beautiful way. Amen. Amen. Yeah, like that that is that is a great point that you made. If we ever start preaching through the Bible, it's important for us to preach through the different sermon the different letters and books and then as we stop and we pause and we pray and we we meet Jesus in the text now the, the books that reveal to the most to us may be the books that if we ever think about what should we specialize in or what would I enjoy, it, it's it's easier to share on the books that sh have done the most transformation in our life. Mm. We could show like, all right, this is why I enjoy this so much because I've seen my life change. I've met Jesus in every verse, in every chapter of this book. And mm -hmm. I know what Romans did for me. So I want to spend my life sharing with you how beautiful this letter is because I know mm -hmm. what it did for my growth as absolutely, a you know, and mm -hmm. that's a great tip for any of the students or anybody who may watch this. If you ever have questions about what, what, where are you, is God calling you, you know, as you continue to search the scriptures, that could be one of the major ways that you could see which one is telling you, preach me, specialize in me focus on me because I'm speaking directly to your life, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we go into like, how do we look at Romans? If we're going to start preaching this book, this letter that Paul wrote, how, how do we approach it? Sure. I think that's, that's a really, really important question. So let me throw, throw a question back at you, Chris. Um, what's, What's a phrase or what's a, an idea from the book of Romans that sticks out to you? When you think about the book of Romans, what is, what is it that comes to your mind? Righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. And, you know, Paul spends a lot of time talking about righteousness by faith. And I believe we should be preaching righteousness by faith. But when we are preaching uh, the book of Romans, I think we have to think about what Paul has in mind. What is the end goal 
that Paul has in mind when he writes the book of Romans. And in order to, to get to that, we have we kind of have to go into the, the historical background of, of why the book of Romans is written. Now, when Paul writes letters, he typically likes, write, likes to write to churches that he's pastored already. So, you know, Philippi, Corinth, um, Ephesus, and so on and so forth. And and he loves these churches. And, you know, he has a lot to say to them. He spent, he spent hours, you know, he's been sweating and he's been, you know, sh shedding sweat and blood for, for them. And, you know, they've been, he's been ministering them and with, you know, in the trenches. But Ro the, the church in Rome is not like that for Paul. Actually, Paul has not been to Rome at this point. You know, the majority of the members are strangers to him. And and I want you to, you know, I want the, the, the listeners to, to ask yourself the question, why would Paul write such a, a densely theological treatise, if you will, to a bunch of Christians that he has not ever met? You know, it's one thing if I'm writing to my own church, the Lombard SDA, you know, let's say I've left the church, you know, I've, you know, I've moved on to a different church and, um, you know, looking back, you know, I, I'm thinking about my old members, you know, and I write this, this the theological work, you know, it, that's one thing to do. What, which church do you go to, Chris? What's I, your, what's your local church? My, my local church as of right now is, uh, I just go to PMC for right now. Okay. So PMC. So, so Pioneer Memorial Church. I spent a year doing I spent a year doing uh in in intern pastoring at the Grace Place. After okay. I, after I went to Zambia, now I am focusing more on evangelism. So Okay, so let's 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 let's, let's say the a, Grace Place. Mm -hmm. So, um it's one thing for me to write to my local church or to the churches that I've um pastored previously, but if I were to write to the Grace Place, for example, I've never been to that church. I know a few people there. You know, I have a few friends that attend the Grace Place. Why would I write such a densely theological work when I'm writing to the Grace Place? You know, why you know, spending you know a lot of ink on this and um, sixteen chapters. So you have to wonder why Paul is doing this. And, and here's the reason why. Let me get to the conclusion and let me work, work my way back. So Paul is writing the book of Romans because he wants to deal with the problems in that church. And the problem is this. People don't get along. The Jews and the Gentiles don't get along. The weak in the faith and the strong in the faith don't get along. So what Paul wants to do is he's going to lay down the gospel so that the gospel will transform people's lives, that people will get along. So what, what is Paul trying to do? Paul is writing from Corinth, and um, he's on his way to Jerusalem. And after going to Jerusalem, he's going to go all the way to Spain. He's, he's trying to reach to the western end of Europe, and he's literally trying to take the gospel to the ends of the world now. And on his way to Spain, he's going to stop by in Rome, a city that he's never been to. You know, this is this is the capital city of the world at that time. And he's going to he's going to solicit his their prayers. He's going to solicit their support, financial support, and all of those things. But he recognizes that this church is a church that is split. How do we know that? Let's go to Romans chapter fifteen. Romans chapter fifteen and um, verse seven. Romans 15, verse 7 says, it says, Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, in the previous chapter, Romans chapter 14, verse 1, he says something very similar. He says, receive one who is weak in the faith. So you have members who are Jews. You have members who are Gentiles. You have people who are weak in the faith, strong in the faith, people who have differing theological ideas of, of whether you should, you know, eat meat offered to idols or not, you know, people have differing ideas and people are not willing to eat with one another. People are not willing to congregate with one another, fellowship with one another. And Paul is wanting to get their support. And if the church is divided, he's not going to get that full support that he needs. So what he's going to do is he's going to delve into the gospel, not because they don't know it, now, if you go to the last chapter, he's greeting several people, and among them are people like Pris Prisca and Aquila. Now, these are people that have lived with Paul in Corinth. You know, these are people that have done ministry with Paul. You know, they've been teaching with Paul. So 
it's not that they don't know the gospel. If Prisca and Aquila are serving in Rome now, they have shared the gospel with their church members. Right? You know, the people know the gospel. It's not, it's not that they don't, you know, have an understanding of the gospel, but the problem is the gospel has not transformed their lives. They know it in theory, but it has not brought them to a point where the Gentiles and the Jews are now coming to eat at potluck together. The weak in the faith and the strong in the faith are not willing to, to sit down together and fellowship together, washing each other's feet. They're not willing to do that together. So what Paul is going to do is he's going to now reintroduce the gospel so that they have a full understanding of the gospel that is not just about me and God. That's how we understand the gospel. I'm a sinner and God saved me. Praise the Lord. But that's not what Paul is trying to get at. Yes, that's true. But this relationship should affect this relationship. How does my relationship with God affect my relationship with my brothers and sisters? That's what Paul is trying to get at. Now, I think a lot of the problems that we have when we preach the book of Romans is that we talk about the theory of righteousness by faith, but we really don't get at how does that righteousness by faith make me a better church member? How does that make me a better father, make me a better um, better, better husband, a better wife? And how does that help me in reconciling with a brother or a sister that is very different from me? It may be he or she may be different in culture, in, in skin color, um, in language, you know, people that are different from me in, in their theological leanings. How does the gospel help me to reach out to those people and actually make them brothers and sisters with me? And I think that, that's, Paul, that's what Paul is trying to get at. So let's come back to um, Romans chapter 1. Um, any, any comments or, or anything that you wanted to add there? No, it's, 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 it's good because what I'm hearing you say is how does righteousness by faith not only help me to connect with God in an intimate relationship, but how does it help me to connect with those around me who are, who are in God's image in an intimate relationship. So mm -hmm. this is the questions to ask because if if the gospel is just allowing us to have a better relationship with God, but we're not having a better relationship with our wife, kids, church members, colleagues in class, the people we work with, our neighbors, then what is that that's not the fullness of the gospel. No. And I think, you know, the gospel should be in a, in a cross shape, you know, our relationship with God, but our relationship with others as well. So just to get into a little bit more of the historical background, you know, um, most Christian churches started with the Jews. And, you know, you know, whatever city you're in Europe, you know, most, you know, if you're in, um, you know, most churches, they, they started with, with, you know, related with synagogues. But what happened in um, AD 49 was that there was a quite a commotion in the synagogues over the question of a man named Crestus, um, according to uh, Suetonius. Um, historian Suetonius says, you know, there's been a commotion about a guy named Crestus, and um, that Crestus was actually Christ. You know, they they um, read Christos as Crestus. And um, what the emperor does is he actually ends up expelling the Jews from the city, uh, city of Rome. And we see that in Acts chapter 18. You know, that's how um, Prisca, Prisca and Aquila come, to, uh, you know, they, they're kicked out of Rome. They come to, um, they, they come to, um, they come to Corinth. And um, that means that the Christian church, which was primarily a Jewish church because most members were Jews, is now mostly a Gentile church because most of the Jews have now been expelled out of Rome. Now, later on, they, they come back after, after uh, Claudius is dead. Most Jews come back to the church, and now the majority is the Gentiles. And you have this, this power struggle now between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. They have differing ideas. They have different theological leanings. They have different tendencies. They have different cultures. And 
they're not willing to worship together. They're not willing to, to, to eat together. They're not willing to fellowship together. And um, kind of um, is very similar to what we have in the Adventist church today in some ways. You know, we have you have your Korean churches, you have your white churches, you have your Hispanic churches, you have your black churches. And, and you know, that, that may be necessary at times, but are we willing to work together uh, when it comes down to it? And what Paul is trying to get at is the gospel should transform our hearts so much so that we're willing to work with, with anyone, you know, whether it be um, whatever church that, that you're in and being able to work with your neighboring churches, you know, although they may be different from you, how they worship, how they do, do, do different things. But um, if we come to um, Romans chapter one, verse 16 here for a second, um, it's a verse that I've mentioned earlier. It says, Paul says here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So that's why he's he's mentioning the Jew and the Gentile here, because that's the problem that he's trying to trying to wrestle with. You know, he's trying to help the gospel transform their lives, bringing them to salvation, and not only bringing them to, only to salvation, but also to a reconciliation uh, between these two groups of people. And um, you know, if you go on to the rest of of the chapter here in chapter one, you know, he talks about the different sins that are. Uh, um, occurring throughout the world and they're mostly gentile sins if you if you look at the list that of sins there it's primarily gentile sins that are being mentioned and you can imagine when the the letter of romans is being um, read to the churches you know you can imagine the jews saying amen you know yes the gentiles are sinners yes they're 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 subpar people they're subpar christians and so on and so forth you know but then if you go to romans chapter 2 Paul gets into the Jewish sins. And then you can imagine the Jewish, you know, Jewish Christians in the church you're getting a little quiet and the Gentiles saying amen to that. And then he comes to Romans chapter three and he says, guess what? All have sinned. Mm. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. He's a sinner. She's a sinner. We're all a sinner that is in the need of grace. You're, you know, whether you're a Jewish Christian, whether you're a uh, fourth generation seventh day Adventist, or whether you're you're somebody walking off the street, guess what? We're all equally sinners, and that means I shouldn't be feeling holier than you just because I've been a Christian, you know, third generation. I'm an Adventist, you know, I'm a second generation pastor. That shouldn't, you know, make me feel that I'm b better than than any of you know anybody. Um, so Paul says, you know what? Everybody's a sinner. Everybody's in the need of grace. So he's trying to 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 bring that together, uh, bring these people together, and saying, "Guess what? You're a sinner. He's a sinner. She's a sinner. Everybody's equally a sinner." And that means, you know, by the grace of God, we're saved. Which means I have no claim to superiority over you, Chris, just because I'm whatever, right? So um, I want us to look at um, any questions or comments thus far. No, it's good because it gives us an overall context of the book. One. Some of the notes that I took, I put Romans 1, he, Paul starts to uh, present like the world sins, the Gentile sins. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter, Romans 2, he starts to focus on the Jewish, the sins of the Jews. But then we get to chapter 3, where for all have sinned. And for all have sinned. But, you know, it's, it's, it's that, it, and it opens up our mind because we look at, Romans chapter 3 and we say that sometimes we quote it for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but it doesn't have that full connection in our minds unless we realize what Paul was doing he was saying to the the the, the audience okay this is first the Gentile sin second this is the Jewish sin and we start seeing them interact like yeah yeah pointing finger but then he brings it right back around no all have sinned so we're we're together mm -hmm. we need Jesus Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is the gospel um, according to Paul? If, if we can um, leave Romans for a second, we're going to come back to it. Um, but uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 15, he kind of introduces what his gospel was. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and um, verse Three, he says, for I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. He's talking about the gospel. First of all, what's the gospel? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's number one. Number two, that he was buried. That's number two. Number three, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then number four, and that 
he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to be present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. So he says, this is the gospel, four things. First, Jesus died for our sins. Secondly, he was buried. Number three, he was resurrected. Number four, he was seen. He was manifested. And um, he says, you know, he's he's been manifested to all these people. But more importantly, I've met that Jesus. So that's the content of the gospel. And, and those are all important things. You know, the theology of that is important. But if we go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, he says here, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. So he says, yes, knowing the content of the gospel is important. Knowing the theology of the gospel is important. But he says, when he was preaching the gospel, it was not just the word that he was preaching. It was not just the content of the gospel that he was preaching. He goes on to say, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know, what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So he says, yes, you, you, you understood the word, you understood the content. But more importantly, he says, we preached with power. We preached by the Holy Spirit. And more importantly, you saw what kind of people we were. So if you think about the content of the gospel, the content of the gospel is something that happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus died on the cross, he, he, was, he was buried, he was resurrected, and then he appeared. Those are things that happened 2,000 years ago. So it's an old gospel, if you will. But if you go to Romans chapter 6 now, and I think that's the last passage we'll look at, um, at least this morning. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Actually, there's going to be one more verse. Now. So Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we were buried with Jesus through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what's the gospel? Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He was risen. And then he was manifested. He brings all of those elements together. And he says, guess what? We died with Christ. We were buried in baptism with Christ. Now we are risen to new life with Christ. So the gospel that he's talking about is not just the gospel that happened 2,000 years ago. It's a gospel that is in the present tense. It's something that is happening today. It's not so, yes, Jesus died on the cross. But the more important question is, have you died with Christ? Yes, Jesus was buried and, and in showing that his death was a real final death. But more importantly, are you buried with Christ? Jesus rose from the dead. That's awesome. Yes, praise the Lord for that. But more importantly, have you risen to life with Christ? That's the more important question. And he's saying, he's saying, as we join with Christ in his death and his, and his burial and his resurrection, that should transform us as people who are much more loving than we have been thus far. People who are more accepting than we have been thus far. People who are much more lovable than we have been thus far. And, and what does that take us to? Which, if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, he says, We are always carrying about in the body, in our bodies. What are we carrying? The dying or the death of the Lord Jesus. So you can imagine taking up, up a backpack and you're carrying it around. That backpack that we're carrying around is the death of Jesus. We're participating in the death of Jesus by dying to self. And what's the purpose of that? He says that the life of Jesus also men be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So not only do we die with Jesus, we're buried with Jesus, we're risen with Jesus. Now, the life of Jesus is now manifested as Jesus was manifested to, to Cephas and to, to the 500 and so on and so forth and to Paul. Now, as we're walking around, be living out the gospel by dying with Jesus, being buried with Jesus, being risen, risen with Jesus. Now, we are walking gospels as the life of Jesus is, is emanating from us. Not so much that we're doing it, but the Christ who is living in us, he's the one who is shining forth 
from our lives, transforming our lives, you know, and building bridges, building relationships around us. So uh, as, as, as I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring ourselves to um, uh, wrap up here, you know, yes, righteousness by faith, that's absolutely important, but that's not the final destination. What does righteousness by faith do for us? It should transform our lives that Christ is being manifested through our body. In other words, through our life, you know, as we die with Christ, you know, dying to self, surrendering our life to Christ and going further, burying ourselves with Christ. And then Christ gives us that, that new life. We give that resurrection power. And as we live out that life, as we live out that, the gospel by, by surrendering, being servants and, and having the new life of God, you know, being a new creation, then the gospel reaches its its full destination. The gospel reaches its its full power. And, um, you know, if you think about, you know, Paul says in in 1 Thessalonians, the passage we just read, you know, he says, you know, I didn't preach just in word only. And if you think about the church in Thessalonica, Paul built, Paul started the church in a place where he was only for three weeks. Imagine that. You know, he was in that city just for three, four weeks, and yet he was able to start a church there. Why? Because he had the power of the gospel. Not just that he spoke the words, the contents of the gospel, but he was living it out. He was dying along with Christ. As he sees the cross, he doesn't only see Jesus on the cross. He sees himself being crucified with Christ on that cross. As he thinks about the burial of Christ, he's not just seeing Jesus entering in that grave. He sees himself entering that grave with Jesus. And on resurrection morning, he's not just seeing Jesus. He's seeing himself being resurrected with Christ. And now the life of Christ is being manifested through our lives. And we're not feeling better than anybody else because we recognize how, how sinful we are. We recognize that, that, that Tim is dead. We recognize that Chris is dead and Jesus lives in us. And that means I have no claim of superiority over anyone, whether it be you, whether it be anybody else, whether it be... You know, someone who feel who I feel like, oh, that person's a, you know, I know that person's sin in, in church, and we gossip and so on. No, 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 we can't do that. We have no claim to superior over anybody, and that means we can reach out to anybody because we're not better than anybody. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get at in the Book of Romans. So, um, yeah. Amen. Praise God. Well, I got my notes, and I'm going to be going over these. These are amazing. This is good. I'm inspired. And and it and it touches to my heart too about how I preach every single text. Like this is a framework where every single text we look at should be, okay, how do we meet Jesus? And how like what does righteousness by faith do in us? But what does that lead us to do? And when we come to God and we surrender and we become this new creation, Romans 12, 1 and 2, one of my favorite verses. But what does that do for us in how mm -hmm. we regard to others around us? Mm -hmm. Oh, so that that's a big question from every text that we preach. What does absolutely do? no. So now this is amazing. Thank you. We appreciate it. You know what? You know, I, I do want to add to something. You know, you mentioned um, Romans chapter twelve, verse one and two, and, and that's that's really important because you know if you look at most of the studies that we book, do on the book of Romans, you know, I you know I I I think. The, the 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 Sabbath school lesson that we had on Romans a, a couple of years back, I think it was it had the same pattern. You have twelve weeks studying through Romans chapter one to eleven, and then you have one week that that goes through Romans chapter twelve to sixteen. And Romans chapter twelve to sixteen is the practical part. You know how do we live as Christians? And we spend so much time on the theology of the gospel, we really don't talk about. How does the gospel transform us? And how does it t t teach us to live as gospel Christians? So you have such an emphasis there on the theology. And but by the time that you reach the end of the theology, you're so worn out. You're like, okay, there's some practical things that, that Paul talks about. Okay, you can kind of study that on the, your own. And I don't think that's that's really helpful. I think we have to have that end goal in mind. And we have to really talk about, yeah, yes, the gospel. But how do we live? How then shall we live? And, and Paul gets into that in Romans chapter 12. He says, therefore, based on everything that I've said about the theology of, of the gospel, therefore, 
offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And therefore, how shall we live? He's, and then he gets into the practical of how people should be living in humility and so on and so forth. So, um, yes, talk about the theology, but then talk about how that theology teaches us we should live. Amen. 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 So as we come to a, a close today, let's um, let's pray. And I want to let everybody know I've been blessed. I'm blessed. I'm I'm ready to preach now. He he got me excited, but I'm I'm also humble before the word of God. And I'm excited for everybody that's gonna watch this video and be encouraged by the context of how we approach Romans and the transformation it does for our lives. So may God continue to bless us all as we approach his word humbly and allow it to mm. transform us but also allow us to abide in him so that we can mm -hmm. light and that love and the presence of jesus to everybody we encounter that's what i took that's my takeaways from this not only preaching it but how does it come in and transform us so that we can show mm. that love and equality for everyone around us as jesus would mm. pastor i'm mm -hmm. gonna have to close us in prayer yes sir yes sir gracious father in heaven lord we thank you for your word, uh, not just in the text, but we thank you for the word who is Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, um, we really um, recognize that that we're, we're nobodies, we're, we're sinners, and yet you loved us enough to give us your son, Jesus Christ, and Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for all the preachers out there who may be watching in, listening in, and um, Lord, we pray that you will empower each and every one of them that that they will preach the word who is Jesus Christ through the word, which is the scriptures, that they will uplift Christ, not only in their words, but also in their lives, Lord. We want to be transformed preachers, and that we are living out the gospel among people. So, Lord, help us to that end. And, Lord, when we do fall, I know I, know I fall so many times, or may we not be discouraged, but may we stand up again following Christ wherever he leads us till the day we die. Lord, we love you and we thank you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And for all the pastors out there, we want to encourage you to take this video, share this with your elders, share this with your lay preachers, your pathfinder leaders, Sabbath school teachers, even those who lead out in prayer meetings so that they could preach the book of Romans, the letter that Paul wrote effectively, Christ-centered. And also I want to give a I want us I want to ask Pastor Tim, can you point us to your YouTube channel for those who are looking to hear some Christ-centered gospel-filled preaching? I know you do what series are you working on right now? Uh currently I'm going through the book of Revelation. We're on uh we're going into Revelation chapter 13. And the way that I approach it is um, I do talk about the historical fulfillment of the prophecies, but more importantly, I'm trying to show how, uh, what, who Jesus is and what Jesus is like through the book of Revelation. And I think that's more important because, you know, Peter says, when we study prophecy, we should, pro we should study until the morning star rises in our hearts. And that morning star is Jesus. And, um, you know, if, if, the study of prophecy is making us more knowledgeable on historical events, but not more loving. That's a problem. If, if we're just understanding that the timeline and we don't understand Jesus and, and his character better um, through the book of Revelation, we're studying in the wrong way. So we're, I'm actually focusing much more on the character of Christ and what he's doing in the book of Revelation, more so on the time prophecies and so on and so forth. And I do get into that, but but more importantly, what's he, what he's doing. So I'm going through the book of um, Revelation um, and uh, I will, the uh, link is youtube.com uh, forward slash Lombard, L-O-M-B-A-R-D-S-D-A. And um, I, I do have a series on, a uh, full series on the Gospel of John, um, the, the book of Hebrews, the book of, Rev, um, the book of Romans, um, book of Galatians, um, Revelation, book of Daniel. So I have a full series and uh, I spent about one sermon per chapter sometimes two or three per chapter sometimes, but um, I have a series of all of those in there. So if you're, if you'd like to um, de delve into the, the word together, you're more than welcome to, to check it out. Lombard SCA. Yep. And, and what I do is 
even after coming home from church, if I'm not too tired on a particular Sabbath, I'll go right to my TV, turn on the YouTube, go to Lombard, and hear some good preaching by the grace of God. You know, by the grace of God. All right. Thanks for everyone for joining us. We will be back again. Don't forget to like and subscribe and to share it with at least one friend who loves to preach Jesus. God bless you all. And thank you, Pastor. We appreciate you for joining us. It's a blessing. See you next time. Thanks so much, Pastor. Bye-bye, everybody. Blessings.